take a look at our homework from last night. We had two bits of homework. The first one was worksheet number 16, question number 5 and 7. The second one was page 665, check and reflect questions, 4 and 5, 7 to 8, and question number 11. Any issues with the two questions on worksheet number 16, questions 5 and 7? So we've got a request to go over both of these questions. Question number five says, the inverted real image of a six centimeter tall object. So our object height is six centimeters tall. Right? That's going to be HO. They're telling me the characteristics of the image here, or at least a couple characteristics of the image here, before we even begin the question, really. The, the image is inverted. The image is real. The object is six centimeters tall. The image is twice as tall as the actual candle. That means the magnification is 2. Now, is it positive 2 or is it negative 2? Well, if we assume that the object is right side up and we get an inverted image, then the magnification should be negative 2. Good. It should be negative because the image is on the opposite side of the principal axis as our object. The candle is 15 centimeters from the mirror. This is going to be DO. The focal length is 10 centimeters. It doesn't tell us what kind of, I don't think it tells us what kind of mirror we have here, does it? Uh, no, it doesn't. How do we know whether it's a positive F or a negative F if it doesn't tell us what kind of mirror we have? A lot of people will just forget and make it positive because they've not even thought to think, to think about uh, whether it's a positive or negative. And they end up being right, but by luck. Then I said, do you know how we know it's a positive? Good. There's a couple of things there, right? First one is exactly what you said. The only mirror that will produce an inverted image is a concave mirror. Convex mirrors always produce a, an upright image. Right? They also always produce a virtual image. So if you have an inverted image and or a real image, then we know that it's got to be a concave mirror, a converging mirror. Therefore, the focal length would be a positive value. Calculate the image height and the image distance, hi, di, and we want to find the attributes, although we already have two of the attributes, right? It's inverted and it's real. All right. Uh, where do you start? Well, it doesn't really matter. Um, let's start with this one. 1 over do plus 1 over di, Claire. Uh, F, uh, do we know the focal point? We do. It's, it's uh, 10. The object distance here is 15. We can find a common denominator for this one pretty easily if we wanted to. Okay, if you like doing the, the common denominator thing and not using your calculator, then be my guest. The common denominator, denominator, if you can say the word, would be 30. I would make it 3 over 30, 2 over 30, do the subtraction. Not that hard. But we can also do it with our calculators. Let's pull the calculator out here. And let's say 10x to the minus 1. Subtract 15x to the minus 1. Gives me 0 0.033. Let's flip that over to get di. di ends up being equal to positive 30 centimeters. The image distance is 30 centimeters. Got that. Now let's find the image height. Let's say hi over ho equals negative di over do. That's part of our magnification equation, right? hi over 6 equals negative di over do. And do was, is that 15? 15 centimeters. All right, so. What does that work out to be? 12? I think it is. Uh, negative 12, right? All right. We, we know we should get a negative number because they told us in the very beginning of the question that it was an inverted image. Right, Caden? It was an inverted image. Therefore, the hi should be a negative value. That's exactly what we got. If we get something that's not a negative value, then we should look at that again because they're telling us that it should be a negative value. They're telling us it's an inverted image. What's the other characteristic? We got that it's inverted. We got that it's real. Is it larger or smaller or same size? 
Larger, smaller, same size. Yep, it's larger. The image height is 12, the object height is 6, it's got to be larger. I don't know if anybody's noticed this or not, but the ratio of image height to object height is the same opposite sign, but same number as the ratio of image distance to object distance. So if you get an image height that's bigger than the object height, it's bigger, right? If you get an image distance that's bigger than the object distance, it's bigger. You don't even need to do worry about the image height or the object height, right? You know if the image is further away from the mirror than the object is, then you know that you've got a bigger image. Did anybody spot that? Anybody else catch that? Yes? I mean, in the end, if you have the image distance and the object distance, and you don't spot that, all you're going to do is calculate the magnification. And with a real quick calculation, you're going to see that M is more than 1, and therefore it's a bigger image. It saves you that calculation if you spot that. All right, number six, seven, I mean. Number seven. A three centimeter tall object, we'll make that HO, make it positive, produces a virtual image that's two centimeters tall. This is going to be HI, but is HI going to be positive or negative? We don't even know what kind of mirror we have. Doesn't tell us whether it's right side up or upside down. If you get a virtual image, think back to your radiograms. If you get a virtual image, it must be what? Right side up or upside down? There's six radiograms that give you a virtual image. All six of them give you an image that is right side up. Therefore, this HI needs to be positive. It has to be right side up as long as the object is right side up. All right, the distance from the mirror to the image is 2.5 centimeters. That's going to be DI, positive or negative. It's a virtual image. It should be negative 2.5 centimeters for a virtual image. We want to find the focal length, and we want to find the type of mirror used. Once we get the focal length, that'll tell us right away what kind of mirror it is, right? Because if it's positive, it's concave. If it's negative, it's convex. Um, yes. All right, so let's go 1 over F is equal to 1 over DO plus 1 over DI. Let's say 1 over um, F is equal to 1 over... Do we even know what DO and DI are? We don't know what DO is. DI is 2.5, but it's negative. All right, let's get DO. Let's say HI over HO equals negative DI over DO. What was DO? Uh, that's what we're trying to find, right? Is that right? Is that right? Is that right? What is it, Wilson? Negative, negative 2.5, right? Our image distance is a negative value because it's a virtual image. We've got to put it in as a negative value there. Negative, negative gives us a positive. Um, let's take the DO up by multiplying, the 3 up by multiplying, the 2 down by dividing. I think we get 3.75 there, don't we? 3.75 centimeters. Now, you could find a common denominator here as well, but it's a lot harder than it is when you've got numbers like 10 and 30. So let's, let's definitely pull up the calculator on this one. Let's say uh, 3.75, x to the minus 1, subtract 2.5, x to the minus 1. Or we could have added negative 2.5x to the minus 1, because it's the same thing. Enter, flip that over. We get F is equal to negative 7.5 centimeters. All right, what kind of mirror is it? Concave or convex? Converging or diverging? Diverging. Right, because we get a negative focal point, a virtual focal point, a focal point for which the rays don't really converge, they virtually converge.
All right. Uh, we also had page six sixty five, and the questions we had there were four and five, seven and seven and eight, and question number eleven. Any issues with any of those questions, please? All right. Let's take a look, a peek at number eight and eleven. Number eight says if an object an object is four centimeters high and it's located 10 centimeters in front of a concave mirror. What's this going to be, this four centimeters? It's four centimeters high. This is our HO, our object height, right? What's this? 10 centimeters in front of a concave mirror. It's DO. Is it positive or negative? How do you know DO is positive? Not because it's concave. It's in front. Eh. You know what? It's always positive for us, right? DO is always positive for us. If you have a physical object, it's got to be a real object. Okay, it's got to be positive. Concave mirror, I'm going to circle that because that's going to tell me that we have a positive focal length. Although in the end, we're solving for the focal length, so we don't really need to know that right now. The image is produced is right side up. It's uh, virtual, and it's five centimeters high. This is going to be HI, this 5 centimeters. Is that a positive HI or a negative HI? Should I put a little negative in there or leave it? Why should I leave it? How do you know that it's a positive HI as opposed to a negative HI? It tells us it's upright. So it's a positive HI. Let's find the focal length here now. So 1 over F is equal to 1 over DO plus 1 over DI. Uh, 1 over the focal length is equal to 1 over 10 plus 1 over, we don't know what DI is. Let's find it. HI over HO equals negative DI over DO. HI is 5. HO is 4. Negative DI is, as we're trying to find, DO is 10. DI becomes equal to negative 5 over 4 is 1.25. I think it's 12.5. Is that right? Neg 12.5. Let's plug that in. Neg 12.5. And now let's pull up the calculator and let's do our thing here. We're going to say it's 10x to the minus 1. Subtract 12.5x to the minus 1. Flip it over. And we get 50. F is equal to positive 50. Should be two digits, I guess. Um, is that right? Yeah. We predicted that we should have got a positive focal length, right? Because it was a concave mirror. And sure enough, we did. So you get that. I mean, no guarantees that you're right, but. Listen, if the numbers that you get are consistent with what you predicted based on the wording of the question, then you're probably right. And finally, let's take a look at question number 11. I like this one. No math involved in this one. Just a qualitative type thing. So some flashlights and headlights use concave mirrors to help generate a light beam. If the light source is positioned at a focal point of the mirror, would all the reflected rays travel outward parallel to the principal axis? Explain your answer. Let's draw a ray diagram, not for the headlight or the flashlight right now. Let's draw a ray diagram for a scenario where you have light rays coming from a far off object, meaning they're going to be essentially parallel to each other. So let's make it the far off object a satellite. Let's make it a, make it a geosynchronous television satellite. You guys know what geosynchronous is? Maintains its same position above the Earth. That way you know where to find the satellite, right? You're not always looking for the satellite. You know where it is because it's always in the same place. How many people have satellite TV? If you have satellite TV, you've got a satellite receiver on the side of your house or on the roof of your house, and it's pointed at a satellite in the sky. It's pointed at a geosynchronous satellite a, a long ways up, a really, really long ways up in the sky. Now, if that satellite moved positions relative to where you are, then you'd constantly have to adjust your satellite receiver. The good news is you don't have to because it's always in the same place relative to you. That satellite in the sky sends down rays of radio waves. 
that are effectively parallel. Lots of them, not just three, lots of them. They will all go through, once they reflect off of the, the reflector, they'll all go through the focal point. Those radio waves get detected by that big object that is sticking out from your satellite receiver. That's the focal point of your receiver. Does that make sense? If you doubled that distance, you'd get the center of curvature, or the radius of curvature of your satellite receiver. Now, if all the rays parallel to the principal axis will converge at that focal point, then the angle, and the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, then all the rays going the other way in exactly the same path must go back along exactly the same path. In other words, parallel to the principal axis. So when we have a light source that's at the focal point, it produces light rays in every which direction. These are three of them. This light ray, this light ray, and this light ray. That's three of those light rays. Those three light rays will reflect back parallel to the principal axis, just as the radio wave that came from the satellite in the sky reflected through the focal point. So, will they, question says, will they travel outward parallel to the principal axis? The answer is yes. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have ever noticed this, but when you look at your headlight, the bulb in your headlight, the bulb is a certain distance away from the reflector in the headlight that's behind the bulb, right? That distance would correspond to the focal length. So that light bulb would be at the focal point of that headlight. Same thing with a flashlight, right? You ever notice this on a headlight? The one side of the headlight bulb, not the headlight itself, but the bulb, is painted black. You ever notice that? You install a bulb, the end of it is black. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it's made black? Yeah? Yeah. You know what? I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure if light reflects off of that and back into the uh, mirror or not. I'm not really sure about that. No. No, that's a good guess, but no. When you drive down the road, where do you notice the vast majority of the light is going from your headlight? Straight ahead of you, right? If you didn't have this painted black, right, the front of that bulb painted black, then you would have rays of light going not only back towards the mirror and then reflect parallel to the principal axis, in other words, go straight ahead of you, you'd have rays going everywhere. So not only would you light up the highway in front of you, you would light up the field over there. And as you're driving by somebody's house, Okay, your light, the light from your headlights would go through their living room win window or their bedroom window or whatever. So it would provide a lot of extra light, which in some cases might actually be a good thing, but in many cases it would be a bad thing because it's kind of like light pollution. Normally you need to see in front of you, right? You don't need to see you know, off 50 feet off the road. So basically it's to prevent that. Because that's colored black there, this beam of light never makes it out. Neither does this one. Neither does this one, and so on. For the most part, the beams of light that make it out are the ones that make it back to the reflector, and those are going to be reflected back parallel to the principal axis. Make sense? Okay. Yesterday, we introduced the idea of refraction, the bending of light. When light, or any wave for that matter, goes from one medium to the other, it bends, it changes direction. Does anybody remember why it changes direction? Fundamentally, light changes direction when it goes from this to that because of what? Good, because the speed of the light changes. It either increases or decreases. As the speed changes, the direction changes. What else changes as a result of the speed changing? The wavelength. Why does the speed change again? Well, because n changes, the index of refraction. So as n changes, v changes. As v changes, theta and lambda change. If n goes up, 
If N increases, say you're going from air to water or glass to diamond, as N goes up, what happens to the speed of light? It goes down. What happens to theta as V goes down? It goes down. What happens to lambda as V goes down? Down. So V, theta, and lambda are all proportional to each other, or at least V, lambda, and sine theta are all proportional to one another. N is inversely proportional to that. And that's why we have the equation, of course, sine theta 1 over sine theta 2, V1 over V2, lambda 1 over lambda 2, N2 over N1. The index of refraction is inversely proportional to the speed, the wavelength, and the sine of the angle. Therefore, it's N2 over N1. Make sense? We also introduced this idea of dispersion yesterday. Dispersion, which is real closely related to refraction, and in fact, is a specific example of refraction, specific examples, I should say, of refraction. When light strikes a boundary between air and glass, so we have a glass prism here, then that light is going to refract. It's going to bend. If it's one color, it might bend like this and come out the other side. If it's multiple colors, then because the glass has a different index of refraction for each different color, each different color will bend a slightly different amount. If each color bends a slightly different amount, then it's going to split up and give us a rainbow on the other side. Which color appears at the top of that rainbow? Red. Which color appears at the bottom of the rainbow? Violet. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. In other words, red light refracts the least, violet light refracts the most. Dispersion will happen because the index of refraction for whatever material that you're dealing with for, for red light is lower than the index of refraction than for violet light. Right? The higher the index of refraction, the more light bends. That means violet light will appear further down than red light. Yep? Should we, like, know this? Yes, you should know this. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, Chase just asked, should, should we should memorize the order of the colors? Yeah, you should. But honestly, you probably learned that in grade two, Roy G. Bibb, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. You do have to remember, I mean, of course, you didn't learn this in grade two. You do have to remember that the higher the frequency of EMR, the higher the index of refraction will be. Now, it's not dramatic, but it is measurable. So in other words, in this glass, the index of refraction for violet was, was more than it was for red. You know that because violet bent more. Right? Wilson, do you have a question? Yeah. All right. Yesterday, we left you with four uh, practice problems on page 668. We didn't assign those for formal homework. How many people actually finished them in class yesterday? Not very many? All right, I'm going to give you about four or five minutes to finish those up right now. Okay, and then if you have any questions, we'll go over one. If not, we'll go over one more example, and we'll call it a day. All right, if we're okay with those questions, I want to do one more example here. It says, a ray of yellow light uh, with a wavelength of 570 nanometers travels from air into diamond at an angle of 30 degrees. That means that air, air is medium number one, diamond is medium number two. It goes in at an angle of 30 degrees. What do you think that we've got there, that, th that theta, that angle? Is that going to be theta one or theta two? It's a little bit tricky the way that's worded, right? It's going from air into diamond at 30 degrees. That's going to be theta 1. If it's going into the diamond at 30 degrees, that's going to be theta 1. If it was coming out of the diamond at theta 1, at uh, 30 degrees, that would be theta 2. Now, as it turns out, we don't even need that angle in this question at all. But we want to still be able to identify it properly, because in some questions, obviously, we do need it. We've got a wavelength here as well. It's 570 nanometers. We actually don't have to convert here from nanometers to meters, although we can. We don't have to because nanometers over nanometers cancels, right? In these questions in Snell's law, the units always cancel. So we normally go with meters, but if you're given something in some other units other than meters, then you can stick with that if you want, or you can go back to our standard and convert to, to, uh, to meters. 
Uh, what was that, lambda 1 or lambda 2? Normally, if it says it's got this wavelength going from this material to this material, then that's going to mean it's lambda 1. We're looking for V2, the speed of light in the diamond, and we're looking for lambda 2, the wavelength in the diamond. I want to do question B first. Okay, we'll come back to question A in just a second here. Question B, the wavelength of the light as it travels into the diamond. Let's do lambda 1 over lambda 2 equals N2 over N1. Lambda 1 is 570. Lambda 2 is what we're trying to find here. N2, remember, N1 is its air, N2 is diamond. So it's going to be 2.42 over 1. Don't get these mixed up. Don't get those backwards. If you do, the answer will be there. Right, the multiple choice answer will be there. All right, let's solve for lambda 2. Uh, the lambda 2 goes up, the 1 goes up, the 2.42 goes down, and we end up with uh, 570 divided by 2.42. We get 236. And because we didn't convert our lambda 1 into meters, left it in nanometers, lambda 2 will be in nanometers as well. That should make sense for us, right? The index of refraction went up, the speed went down, the lambda went down. It goes along with speed, right? If speed goes down, lambda goes down. All right, let's get the speed of light on the diamond now. We know it's going to be less than 3 times 10 to the 8 because n went up, v has to go down. Plus, we can't be bigger than 3 times 10 to the 8. Any suggestion as to how I might find the speed of light on diamond? There's two ways that I can think of, both ways real similar to each other. Katie, what do you want to do? Say it again. Say that again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that works. Have a look at that, everybody. V1 over V2 equals N2 over N1. Now, we're going from air into diamond. We're looking for V2. We've got V1, right? V1 is going to be 3 times 10 to the 8. Uh, we've got we've got N2, which is 2.42, and we've got N1, which is 1.00. We solve for V2 here. V2 ends up being equal to, okay, take that up by multiplying, ends up being equal to V1 over N2. N1 kind of disappears, right, because it's 1. Make sense? Now, the way that I thought of doing it, to be honest, was real similar to that, but looks a little bit different. I just went back to the definition of index of refraction. I said n is equal to c over v. So v is equal to c over n. 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 2.42. Right? Well, what did you do, Caden? 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 2.42. You just went in a slightly more roundabout way of getting that, but only slightly. And it's one extra variable in there. And that variable has a value of 1, so it's not a big deal. just means a little bit more rearranging, that's all. Is that OK? All right. Your homework tonight, everyone, is going to be page 670, questions number 1 and 3. 1, 2, 3. Please finish those up for tomorrow. Not going to give you a chance to work on those right now, because I want to take a few minutes and talk about the next logical step in refraction. It's called total internal reflection. Total internal reflection occurs when sometimes a ray of light that would normally refract, would normally bend, actually doesn't refract or doesn't bend, but rather reflects. Now, why does that happen? Let me draw a diagram here. Here's a boundary between two materials. The first material is going to be air. Air is an index of refraction of 1.00. Second one is going to be glass. 
glass has an index of refraction of about 1.50, although it does depend upon what kind of glass you have. Here's our normal line that separates, or our normal line that acts at 90 degrees to that boundary between the air and the glass. Here's our incident ray. And of course, our angle of incidence is whatever value of in degrees of that angle between that ray and the normal line. The index of refraction goes up here, right, when we go from air to glass. Index of refraction goes up. What happens to the speed? It goes down. As the speed goes down, the wavelength goes down. What else also goes down? The angle goes down. So what's going to happen to this ray of light? It's going to bend down there such that the angle of refraction is smaller than the angle of incidence. Now, if I increase that angle of incidence to a bigger, bigger value, we went from, say, 30 degrees to 45 degrees, then we're still going to get a theta 2 that's smaller than theta 1. Theta 2 is bigger than it was in the last case, but it's still smaller than the angle of incidence. It doesn't matter how big we make the angle of incidence. The angle of refraction will always be a smaller value. Does that make sense? All right, let's change this diagram around just a little bit. There's our boundary. This time we're going from glass, however, with an index of refraction of 1.5, to air with an index of refraction of 1. Our first ray of light strikes that boundary, and because it's going from a high index to a low index, its speed will do what? Increase. If its speed increases, its wavelength will increase. If its wavelength increases, its angle will increase. So instead of bending toward the normal line like it did right here, it's going to bend away from the normal line, such that theta 2 is bigger than theta 1. Let's increase the angle of incidence a little bit more. That's going to make theta 2 even bigger, still bigger than the angle of incidence, and in this case, bigger than the last, theta 2. Let's increase it a little bit more. At some point, the angle of refraction causes this ray of light to not really refract through the second medium, but rather to skip along the boundary between the two media. We call that a critical angle. That's the angle at which total internal reflection begins to occur. If we increase the angle of incidence to an even higher value, what's going to happen? It doesn't refract, because we can't get an angle of refraction that's less than 90 degrees. So what ends up happening is that it reflects off of the boundary. It bounces off. It's kind of like skipping rocks. How many people have ever skipped rocks? You know how this works, right? You take a nice flat rock and you throw it straight down at the water, right? No. It doesn't work very well if you throw it straight down at the water. So what do you do? Intuitively, you know to make the angle as measured from the vertical, right, the normal line, you make the angle really big. In other words, you try to skip it along. You try to make the, the rock go as close to parallel to the, to the water as you can, right? If you throw it straight down, it's going to go into the water. It's going to change speed. If you throw it at an angle like this, it's going to go into the water. It's going to change speed, and it's going to change direction. If you make the angle as measured from the normal line big enough, then it might not go into the water. It might skip off the water. It might bounce off the water. And that's what's happening here. This ray of light is at an angle that's great enough that it kind of skips off the boundary between the glass and the air. It reflects as opposed to refracts. Now, where the analogy falls apart, when you're skipping rocks, you're going from air to water, right? It can't happen that way when you're dealing with real total internal reflection with light. It has to go the other way around, water to air. Because if you go from water to air to water, or low to high index refraction, Theta 2 is always less than theta 1. To get total internal reflection, theta 2 has to be greater than theta 1. So it can only happen when you're going from high to low. Glass to air, water to air, diamond to air.
All right. Real quickly here. Real quickly. What's the angle of refraction when the critic when you're solving for the critical angle theta c? This is theta c, right? This is the critical angle. What's the angle of refraction right there? What is it? 90 degrees. Remember that. Remember that. Because that's how we're going to end up finding the critical angle is setting theta 2 equal to 90 degrees. The critical angle occurs when theta 2, the angle of refraction, is 90 degrees. We'll pick that up tomorrow, okay?